Welcome to part two of the High Yield Rapid Review series to increase your points on exam day for the Yosemite Step 2 CK and the Yosemite Step 3. If you do a CT scan of a patient with schizophrenia, you will see enlarged ventricles. Also, if you do a CT scan of a patient with Alzheimer's disease, you will see widespread cortical atrophy. This is extremely high yield. Now let's take a closer look at post-strep glomerulonephritis. Okay, one way that they love to test this topic is by assessing hypersensitivity reactions. So this is a type 3 hypersensitive reaction. This is a nephritic syndrome where patients will have red blood cells in their urine as well as red blood cell casts. Um, these patients typically present two to six weeks after a group A beta hemolytic streptococci infection. You'll also note decreased serum C3 concentrations. This is extremely high yield because what they do is um, give you a, a patient, like let's say that there is a, a six-year-old six kid and they had a infection two weeks ago, and now they have, um, you know, blood and cast in their urine. And they're like, what underlying mechanism or, or what is this condition associated with? They can have, um, type three hypersensitivity reaction listed there or the antibody antigen complex. They could also have decreased serum CP concentrations as well as positive anti-streptolysin O and anti-DNAs. Very, very high yield. I know that this slide has a lot of information on it, but don't be overwhelmed. Let's go through it together. Typically, you would want iron to be in the ferrous form. Ferrous, just think of the two of us for like helium and oxygen. You just want them together so that we can get the oxygen we need. However, if the heme iron in the blood exists in the ferric or Fe3 plus form, this is methemoglobin. This is very high yield. Let's say that a patient who recently received lidocaine, benzocaine, uh, nitrate, or dapsone, they present with this dusky colored skin. Their shortness of they have shortness of breath. They're fatigued. They're lightheaded, they have arrhythmias, or even a seizure. So you need to suspect methemoglobinemia in these patients. They can also have a very characteristic dark blood. And vital signs typically show a reduced oxygen saturation. And as I mentioned before, a physical exam may reveal cyanosis as well. So how do we treat these patients? Well, of course, you want to give them supplemental oxygen and IV methylene blue. So methylene blue is a reducing agent that will convert the ferric Fe3 plus iron to the much needed ferrous or two of us iron form. The reduction of heme iron to the ferrous form restores the ability of hemoglobin to bind, carry, and deliver oxygen to tissues. Very, very high yield right here. Another high yield concept that is always tested is, of course, the musculoskeletal system and, uh, you know, their different tests. Here we have decrovane, and this is due to an overuse of the extensor pollicis brevis and AB abductor pollicis tendons. So these patients present with pain at the base of the thumb that is reproduced by the Finkelstein's test. If you hyperflex the wrist, this is called a balance test, and this reproduces the pain caused by carpal tunnel syndrome. Let's say that when your arm is AB or abducted at 60 to 120 degrees, you experience pain. This is called a painful arc test. And a positive painful arc test means that there is rotator cuff impingement. Before I mentioned the Finkelstein's test, so this is where the thumb is held in opposition across the palm and the wrist is ulnar deviated. This, if it's positive, it is decrovane tenosynovitis. 
So let's take a closer look at carpal tunnel syndrome. Of course, this is due to um, an entrapment of the median nerve. And how we treat this initially is with splints. The initial treatment is with splints. But let's say that this patient has been wearing their splints faithfully for like six months, but they're still in pain. And the question would ask like, hey, what's the next best step? Well, that would be to do a nerve conduction study or EMG. And this is indicated for patients with chronic or refractory carpal tunnel syndrome who are being considered for surgery. Of course, the US family likes immunodeficiencies for all step exams, step one, step two, CK, and definitely for the US only step three. So let's take a closer look at the George syndrome. This condition is associated with a thymic hypoplasia and impaired immunity. You can also see conotruncal cardiac defects, hypocalcemia caused by parathyroid hypoplasia and craniofacial abnormalities. The parathyroid hypoplasia leads to severe hypocalcemia after birth, and these patients can present with seizures and neuromuscular instability. If this does sound super confusing to you, remember that you have the CATCH-22 mnemonic, C for cardiac abnormalities, A for abnormal facies, T for thymic aplasia, C for cleft palate, H for hypocalcemia, and 22 for the deletion of one copy of chromosome 22 Q11.2. Another concept that they like to test is bulimia and anorexia nervosa. Patients with bulimia can have parotitis, and it is also associated with elevated amylase. Um, it's also helpful to know narcolepsy. So if there is decreased REM sleep latency and hallucinations or sleep paralysis, then more than likely this patient has narcolepsy. These points are very matter of fact. And you'll notice that for the step three, especially for day one, it's either like, either you know it or you don't. So it's best to just take the time and commit these facts to memory. So let's say that a patient is infused with lactate and they develop panic attacks. This is commonly seen in patients with anxiety disorders. And the thinking is that the amygdala in the brain responds to low pH. Now here we have terbinafine. All the antifungals are extremely high yield. You'll see them definitely for step 2 CK and step 3. So let's take a closer look at terbinafine. Terbinafine inhibits lanastrol synthesis by blocking squalene epoxidase. So essentially it inhibits the formation of ergosterol, which results in a weak cell membrane. Terbinafine is used in the treatment of dermatophytes infections, and onychomycosis. Some high yield side effects include diarrhea, GI upset, taste disturbance, hepatotoxicity, and headaches. Pemphigoid gestation is treated with high potency topical steroids such as triamcinolone and antihistamines, and this condition typically resolves after delivery. Of course, microbiology is high yield for step 2 CK and step 3. For step 3, they typically test you on the common bugs. And two of them include Haemophilus influenzae type B, which is an encapsulated gram-negative cocobacillus, while Pseudomonas is a gram-negative bacillus. Probably wondering, how would they test you on this? They could mention that, you know, maybe a patient with hot tough folliculitis, which is of course associated with pseudomonas, or let's say that the patient has epiglottitis, which is caused by Haemophilus influenzae. So they can give you the clinical scenarios and then give you the, um, the description of the microorganism and ask you, you know, what's the correct answer here? Okay. So now we have Hodgkin's lymphoma. Hodgkin's lymphoma, this has a bimodal distribution. So this presents in patients that are either, you know, really young or, well, in that, their 20s or like patients in like their 50s and 60s. So these patients will present with 
um, enlarge lymph nodes or lymphadenopathy in the neck and mediastinum. They can also have nonspecific constitutional symptoms such as fever, night sweats, weight loss, and paresis. Lab results would show normal leukocyte counts, anemia, increased ESR, and increased serum ferritin. So remember that ESR and ferritin are indicators of inflammation and can be elevated in cancers as well. If you do a chest x-ray or CT scan, this will reveal the mediastinal or hyalur lymphadenopathy. But for a definitive diagnosis of Hodgkin's lymphoma, you should do an excisional lymph node biopsy, and this can reveal reed sternberg cells. These are atypical cells with bilobed nuclei. And you can also see Hodgkin cells that are CD15 and CD30 positive. The most common type of Hodgkin's lymphoma is nodular sclerosis. But the type with the worst prognosis is lymphocyte depleted subtype. So what are some risk factors for Hodgkin's lymphoma? Well, this includes Epstein-Barr infection, immunosuppression, a family history of Hodgkin disease as well. So we can treat Hodgkin's with chemotherapy and radiation therapy.